The first packed question time for 18 months. Post-lockdown, the two political tribes now the masked and the unmasked. Boris Johnson's giant tax grab yesterday has thrown other traditional policy distinctions into confusion. They're going to vote against plans to fix the backlogs and fix social care. Vote Labour, Mr Speaker. Wait longer. Now they're telling millions of working people that they must cough up more tax. Isn't this the same old Tory party always putting their rich mates and donors before working people? Analysis from the Resolution Foundation shows Boris Johnson's £14 billion in tax rises is bigger than anything announced in any budget since 1975. So these are the budgets since 1975 yes. and the tax take. Yes. And that's what happened yesterday. Yes. What does that line there say about the Conservative Party under Boris Johnson? Well, it shows that we have abandoned um, our commitment to being a party of low taxes. That's obviously that, that's what that shows. And why should people vote for you who believe in low taxes? Well, 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 quite. And that's why, unfortunately, we haven't got a general election just around the corner. And that's why um, a, a number of us you know, are voting against the government in the hope that more of our colleagues will have uh, the, the, the guts, frankly, to realise that if they don't oppose these enormous tax increases, then the Conservative Party is finished. It's the Conservative Party that always has been and is and always will be a tax cutting party. Tax cuts. Lower taxes. Lower taxes. The fight for lower taxes will go on. Many Tory MPs worry Boris Johnson has trashed that mantra. But only a few were ready to rebel against the Prime Minister's tax hike tonight. If you create an NHS tax, you have an NHS tax forever. Yeah, yeah. It will never go down. It can right. only go up. Right. No party is ever going to stand at an election saying, I've got a good idea. Yeah. Vote for me, I'll cut the NHS tax. We all know that eventually, as a socialist, you run out of other people's money. And I have to say, I'm sorry, ministers, I'm not going to be able to vote with you tonight, because some of us are going to have to be seen to be standing for another path. Yeah. How many of your colleagues, do you think, if I lashed them to a polygraph, actually agree with you, even if they're voting with the government tonight? Oh, I think almost all of them do. Doesn't uh, it tell us the Conservative Party is in some awful crisis? Doesn't know who oh, it is? Oh, it's an identity crisis. Oh, it certainly tells us that, yes. It certainly tells us we're in an identity crisis. Some Conservatives think Boris Johnson has little choice given the times we live in. Even without Covid, an ageing population, the pressures of climate change will mean a bigger state and the Tories can roll with that. Well, it's certainly the party of the lowest possible taxation and lower than other parties. It's a very different thing, that, isn't it? Maybe, but I think voters will pay attention to that, given the choice. It's still a sellable slogan. I think it is sellable. We've got to face the problems that we have. There's no use just being ostrich-like about it. One former Tory cabinet minister said many Conservative MPs were tonight holding their noses as they vote for Boris Johnson's giant tax hike. They may find they have to carry on doing that for a long time to come. Well, I'm joined now by the Conservative peer, Peter Lilly, who served as Secretary of State for Social Security in John Major's cabinet. Now, I know you've got an alternative idea, and I'll ask you to explain that in a moment, but when you look at this, because it's likely to go through in the next few minutes... Uh, you know, highest tax burden in decades. It won't stop people having to sell their homes. Um, and how do you feel as a Conservative? I feel very worried because the public don't like parties that raise taxes. They don't like parties that break their promises. And it's a mistake to have a permanent tax increase to deal with a temporary problem, namely the backlog of uh, operations that built up during the COVID crisis. And it's a mistake, too, to use tax to solve a problem, which is the problem of uh, often wealthy homeowners uh, who could insure uh, to solve that problem by tax instead of insurance. Yeah, now, just explain your insurance idea, because you're, you're saying it would cost people less and would actually solve the problem of nobody having to sell their house. Yes, if people were given the opportunity, when they retire, to take a charge on their house, which might be of the order of 10% of the value of their house, uh, payable only when they die or sell the house, then they would be entitled to free social care if they needed it. 
and that would roughly cover the cost of those who took out that insurance. Those who don't take out that insurance would be in the present position, but they'd be there by choice, and uh, they would have to pay the costs if they were unlucky enough to be in care for a very long time. Oh, right, but roughly what would it cost, an average person? The average cost, using the figures uh, updated from the Dilnock Commission, was £16,000, but it would be more for a valuable house and less for a less valuable house. And so why is the government not interested in this idea? You must have tried. Well, I tried to interest them, but unfortunately the idea of insurance was considered very early on by Lord Dilnot himself and ruled out because the private insurance companies wouldn't offer such policies for a variety of reasons, uh, particularly because they thought they couldn't persuade people to take out policies to prepare for it during their working life when they were also paying for their pensions and paying off their mortgages. So it was ruled out. They didn't consider the option I propose, which is the government uh, set up a company or back a company owned by um, the private insurance company, something like that, but a state-backed company which could offer that sort of insurance uh, and do so in the way I suggest by, a tax, uh, by taking a charge on their houses when people retire, not uh, asking them to save during their working lives. By, by going for tax, I mean, do you think this, you know, Boris Johnson is fundamentally changing the character of the Conservative Party. You know, we heard one of his ministers, Nadim Zahawi, saying, well, when asked, you know, are you still the party of low tax, saying, well, we're the party of fair tax. I mean, it's all sounding a bit sort of different. Well, it's going to be difficult. Uh, I heard Norman Lamont saying we will be the party of the lowest possible tax, and uh, we will obviously have to try to argue that if that's a credible case. Uh, but we will certainly be in a more difficult position than we would be if we had not done this. Uh, Lord Lilly, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you. Well, let's just have a quick look into the House. The, the critical vote isn't yet. Um, we will come to it when it happens, but it, it is almost certainly going to be a victory for the, the government, despite the fact that there have been rebels speaking up. A lot of those people who were opposed to this particular um, proposal and these tax rises um, are saying or, or were suggesting that they would abstain rather than actually voting against the government. But there has been growing disquiet and, and growing polling evidence that the public today isn't quite as keen on the idea as it appeared yesterday in those snap opinion polls. Uh, and that's been, uh, that's been intriguing all sorts of, of Conservative politicians. Now, one, one politician who... One Conservative who is supporting the government tonight, um, and it, as I say, it is expected to win, is the former Cabinet Minister, Andrew Mitchell, and he joins me now. Um, Andrew Mitchell, I mean, what is a Conservative promise worth? Today, I mean, you were you were despondent at the breaking of the promise on foreign aid. Now you've broken the promise on uh, on tax, on pensions, and on saying people won't have to sell their homes to pay for social care. Well, you're you're entirely right that I do not think the promise on the point seven should have been uh, broken, and of course the point seven took account of the COVID crisis because it was point seven of the British economy, and the British economy had obviously contracted very sharply during the COVID crisis. Uh, this is an entirely different position. I think that people recognise that we have got to get to grips with the care crisis. For two decades now, uh, both political parties have failed to reach a conclusion on this. And I think the public want a conclusion. And this will uh, relieve an enormous amount of the anxiety people have that their value of their home will be wiped out. Uh, in addition to that, of course, the uh, triple lock will now become a double lock, but I don't think any fair-minded person should argue that pensions would go up by 8.5% this year, and of course the double lock will bite this year, so it will be up by at least 2.5% or the level of inflation. Um, and of course next year the triple lock will come back. So I think the public will understand why the government has made this decision. I think the government's been courageous in actually at last grappling with the social care funding issue. But it hasn't, in truth, has it? I mean, this doesn't solve the problem. You cannot say uh, an individual will not have to sell their house in order to pay the social care bill. And that was the promise in the manifesto. So it doesn't solve the problem. All it does is put up tax to go into the NHS. 
Well, I think the public will understand why it is right, given the enormous backlog of operations in the NHS, that additional money should now be found. And, you know, it will ensure that people do not have to fine more than £86,000, which will defend an awful lot of people's homes. Uh, you're right, of course, in what you say about the hotel costs, as it were, not being included. But, that, you know, that is, that, it has largely re removed the anomaly that has been the case since the NHS was originally set up, that if you were in hospital suffering from a terrible uh, cancer-related illness, uh, the costs were met. But if you were suffering from dementia in a home, the costs were not met. And it is that issue which I think the public want to see resolved in a manner that is fair. But are you not basically worried that nobody will believe you anymore? You know, when you go out canvassing at the next election and promise all sorts of things, people will legitimately say, we can't believe a word you say. Well, I, I do think that was a problem with the breaking of the promise on the point seven. But I, as I say, I think the public will understand, firstly, because we have got to grapple with this backlog in the NHS. Uh, they'll understand the need for additional uh, taxation to cope with a once, so far, once in a lifetime uh, global pandemic. Um, and secondly, I, I say I do think they will appreciate the fact that the government has at long last uh, grappled with a, a, an issue which has eluded governments now for more than two decades. Andrew Mitchell, thank you very much. Thank you. Let's just go into the house. I think they are about to give the results. Thank you. They're handing... The eyes to the right, 319. The nose to the left, 248. So the eyes have it, the eyes have it. Unlock. 319 to 248. So what does that mean for the rebellion? You can't be absolutely sure with those numbers because there are people who aren't here and the rest of it. But all the expectations all day have been that there was something like a dozen. I'm just checking whether someone who was keeping an eye on the situation in the voting lobbies to see uh, how many Tories uh, turned up in the Labour lobby uh, hasn't quite texted me that information yet. Uh, but it does feel as though it's in that order with some abstentions on top of that. So. Uh, this is not a serious rebellion, but a lot of them say we are sitting on our hands, people who are unhappy with this move. We may you know, find another moment to move against the government. But on the other hand, you can find Tories who say, well, this is just an acceptance of the kind of world that we live in now. There are going to be very big calls on the state. A Conservative Party in government is going to have to raise taxes if it isn't going to carry on borrowing. There is a very live debate on at the moment uh, in the Tory party and the votes uh, when we actually see the number of rebels here and again I, I think it is pretty small judging by the size of the uh, government uh, majority there. Uh, the votes there don't really reflect the depth of feeling in the Conservative Party tonight as people feel they've been dragged to support something they really don't like. There's been some speculation Gary about what this might mean for an early election. Can we read anything into that? Well there are strong indications that Boris Johnson has thought, chatted to colleagues about the idea of a 2023 election and I think he's uh, very mindful that uh, Labour would probably in that election, if the NHS was in a bad way, campaign strongly, perhaps quite effectively, uh, on, on, on the whole issue of public services. And so he's tried to uh, risk breaking promises from the general election in order to make sure he's protected that flank. And, Cabinet colleagues have been rolled round to that view, uh, as we saw in the meeting yesterday, where there, there was no real opposition to the plan, and tonight most Tory MPs following that lead. I mean, I suppose all this depends on to what extent they can get the NHS backlog down, uh, and that people feel that this money has been well spent. It but but where, where does this take Boris Johnson on his journey towards being the brexit Heza that he wanted to be? Well, he would see it as all part of that sort of identity that you're willing to uh, do some corporatist uh, things that might